you know, Kansas City is one of the top, I don't know, 10, 20 rent growth uh, markets here over the last several months, definitely year to date. So um, the rent growth is there and the cash flow is there because taxes are still relatively low. Welcome to the Cash Flow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and the founder of Catani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Alex Olson. He started his career in commercial real estate as an investor and ultimately decided to take the leap into the field in 2019, finding an underserved niche specializing in multifamily brokerage and 1031 exchanges. He dedicated the last four years to providing clients with the best-in-class tech-enabled real estate advisory platform that streamlines the process of buying, selling, and managing investment real estate, utilizing tax advantage strategies. The focus for the clients, the buyer, seller, or investor utilizing a white glove service that provides them with off-market real estate deals, advisory services, and everything needed to complete his transaction. It's currently located in Kansas City. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, man. Great to be here. Yeah, grateful to have you and uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Learned offline that we have a uh, mutual friend and contact, uh, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so before we jump in, obviously, we got a lot to get to. Give us kind of the backstory. What were you doing before this? And what ultimately led you to uh, taking that leap? Yeah. So, I mean, prior to the world of real estate, I was in, I was basically managing a, a marketing portfolio uh, for a consumer finance company uh, in small dollar lending. And I did that for about 15 years. Uh, but, you know, always was looking for a side hustle. And, you know, you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad as a, as a kid or whatever, and you are trying to become a millionaire. And, you know, the nine to five grind or whatever never really worked for me. I mean, yeah, it worked for 15 years, but I was always wanting and looking for something more. And, uh, you know, we built our, my wife and I built our dream house and we did such a, a good job on it that the value had increased tremendously uh, from the, the point of when we, we closed on it. So I took out a line of credit and decided to make the leap into, uh, into real estate and, you know, fell in love with the process and, you know, the lending and the numbers and the creativity and, you know, the buildings and everything about it. And, uh, you know, I was actually cold calling property owners trying to, to buy their property and I uh, called the guy and he turned into a mentor for me. He's like, man, you keep calling me, we should meet up. And so I said, okay, sure, whatever. And became friends. And, and uh, he said, hey, you know, you're looking for a side hustle. Yeah, real estate's great, but you're going to run out of money. And uh, so why not get your real estate license? And I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to show <laughs> six family homes. You know, there's no way that I'm going to, you know, do the dog and pony show and all this kind of stuff. And he said, no, 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 you could focus on multifamily. And so immediately after that, uh, I got my real estate license within a month. Uh, met, you know, our mutual friend, Logan Freeman, and he recruited me over to uh, a brokerage he was at at the time. And we just started doing, uh, doing multifamily deals together with, uh, with a focus on the 1031 exchange buyers. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's always, it's fascinating how so many people will, uh, you know, kind of start in with the real estate side hustle. And then, it seems like almost always it sucks everyone in, right? Because you really end up getting those things that you want out of a quote unquote job, right? Get a little bit more time freedom. Obviously, you know, you can really uh, produce a lot of money and wealth and all those things that come with it. So I love that. So yeah. you're obviously in Kansas City. It's absolutely exploding right now, right? Kansas City is doing a lot uh, as a city, right? Bringing a lot of infrastructure Kind of touch on what you're seeing in terms of that infrastructure and the growth and, and what it's kind of led to, um, you know, for investors. Sure. So I think a, a lot of what has propelled Kansas City in the last uh, 15 years or so stems from, yeah, progressive downtown redevelopment, which we've seen in other parts of the country. 
Um, but you know, they really took a, a headstrong. They, they built a a the, the arena. So the T-Mobile Center was Sprint Center. They built that without having a tenant. It's a giant, you know, Class A arena. You know, their hope was, hey, look, we're going to get a, an NBA basketball team. And, and with that arena came an entertainment district called Power and Light and uh, really kind of put them on the map with other developers. And then in 2016, there was the streetcar extension, uh, sorry, street, streetcar, which is, you know, a free uh, 1.5 mile ride up and down um, the downtown area. And, you know, then you, you attach to that, you know, a bond passing for creating the $1.5 billion new airport that just went live last week. So, I mean, it's been in the, in the headlines a lot, Kansas City in general. So, I mean, yeah, that's the economic development and the building and the infrastructure. But, of course, you got to have jobs. And the jobs really in Kansas City is centered around, you know, no specific niche. It's all about, you know, we have some large reason, regional hospitals here. You know, it's an eight hour drive to Denver, four hour drive to St. Louis, you know, and then Dallas is seven hours, Minneapolis is seven hours. So all those people that are outside of the metro still kind of have to come to Kansas City for their, you know, large scale medical procedures. So that's a, a driving factor. Then you have, you know, we have a little bit of tech. We have an animal health corridor, we call it. And a lot of blue collar jobs with being in the center of the country, the intermodals, we call them, which is transporting goods and services across the country. Uh, and I touched on the airport a little bit, but that also is a big impact, not just from passengers, but from freight, uh, you know, being in the center of the country. And there's also the Amazon distribution centers and, you know, Meta, uh, Facebook data centers and Panasonic's, you know, $4 billion dollar. Uh, battery plants. So, I mean, all those different things produces jobs. Uh, and then on the on the investor side, you have a landlord friendly uh, area. Both Kansas and Missouri are pretty landlord friendly and lower taxes. Um, so all that combined has really helped put Kansas City on the map from an investor standpoint. Um, you know, but it all started with just being a progressive city uh, 10, 20 years ago. Wow. Those are incredible uh, data points, right? Because when you look at a market, you know, you know, if you're putting your sort of operator hat on and you're looking at new markets, one thing I know a lot of top operators look at is they don't want any one job to be too heavily, right? You don't want to see, you know, like Austin, right? In like the 40, 50% tech range, because, Look what's happening now, right? Is tech is getting these massive layoffs. Austin is starting to come, you know, down from grace. And and of course we knew it had to come down, but it's very much tied to these layoffs and these things that are happening. And so when you look at, you know, a very diverse uh, you know, jobs, very, very big selling point. So obviously a lot of development starting to happen, things like that. Uh, are you getting a lot of class A and that kind of demographic or what seems to be kind of the the main focus uh, there in, in the city? Yeah, so there's tons of class A development. We have another um, uh, large 33, 34 story multifamily tower wow. uh, that is is going to be complete end of this year. It's called uh, Three Lights, so Power and Light District. Uh, which is developed by the Cordish company. They've got all these different incentives and, and, and opportunities for them to continue to building multifamily towers downtown. Um, so that's being built. And then you have, there was a, uh, a class A office building that was built and it was originally built for a tenant and the, that tenant was acquired uh, by somebody else. And so it's like, oh shoot, what do we do with this? But that actually just signed a lease for uh, a Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, relocation um, project. So that's gonna be for the most part full. So there's there's class A there and that's just urban core. And then the suburbs, you know, with the great school districts in many of the suburbs, uh, those have just, I mean, there there's build to rent houses, there's build to rent uh, fourplexes, duplexes, just flying off the shelf in specific locations with massive constructions. You know, we did see 
with rates going up several points uh, from the Federal Reserve last year, a lot of the single family home uh, build to buy projects paused. But then, you know, now we see all these multifamily uh, development that the buildings look similar to the single family homes, but they're, you know, built to rent essentially. And people are getting crazy rents. I was actually just talking to a, a built to rent developer yesterday and they're getting like $2,800 uh, for a three or four bedroom ha- uh, wow. house. I'm not sure, but it's, you know, that's pretty, pretty good money for in the middle of can, you know, middle of market. It's like, why won't you buy a house? Well, you can't find one. Right. So um, anyway, that, that kind of stuff is where a lot of the development is, is either urban core uh, or suburban. And then you have the tried and true uh, towns that are also here as well. Wow. That's incredible. That's definitely a higher rent than I would anticipate for that area. But, you know, based on what you said in terms of the growth and the infrastructure definitely makes sense. And, you know, with the undersupply and a lot of first time home buyers being sort of priced out of the market, right. That rent, it's a very interesting (laughs) kind of time in the market, but one thing about the Midwest is it always seems like it has that steady growth between, you know, people moving there and job growth and, you know, rent growth. Um, sounds like still a very cash flow um, centered uh, market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the cash flow is here now, you know, things get tighter, of course, as taxes do go up, uh, taxes go up over time, takes a little bit of lag for rents to go up. But if you, if you look at the headlines on that too, you know, Kansas city is one of the top, I don't know, 10, 20 rent growth uh, markets here over the last several months, definitely year to date. So um, the rent growth is there and the cash flow is there because taxes are still relatively low. Uh, cap rates are, you know, compressed just like they are everywhere else. Uh, but, you know, people still want to buy here because they know that it's, you know, steady eddy kind of growing market. Are you seeing a lot, getting a lot of attention from out of state investors? Yeah, we do. We have a lot of people from California, which you would expect uh, a, because, you know, it's the most populous state in the in the country, but then B, you know, rent control issues there and just the, the constant uh, tax issues that also present themselves in that state. People might sell a duplex or a fourplex in San Francisco for a million, two million bucks and put that money into, you know, a six or eight million dollar complex in Kansas City. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. For sure. I love that. So we mentioned in your uh, intro that you uh, kind of working on kind of best in class service, tech service, what are kind of some of the things that sets you guys apart from maybe other brokerages? Yeah, our, what we really focus on is people that have 1031 exchange, uh, either coming up or a deadline looming. Uh, we've got a complete off-market list of properties, and we call it our marketplace. And we've generated these deals through cold calling, relationship building, you know, and that starts with a lot of just building trust with sellers. You know, we may not have a listing agreement with the seller on these, but they trust us that we're not going to just bring them any offer, anybody that wants to do a tour. You can't do that through us. You got to have a pre-approval letter. You got to have a letter of intent, and then we can get you in to do a tour. So that's on the seller side. So we build trust there. And then on the buyer side, you know, we can help them and, and really take a lot of time and effort in finding a property management company for you, finding attorneys, um, insurance, uh, all the different service provider boots on the ground stuff that you need here uh, to maybe instead of, you know, man, I'm looking at this, this is a, a crappy five. 5% cap rate or 6% cap rate. Well, with our network of and team, we can make that five, 6% cap rate look like an 8% cap rate because of, you know, reducing your insurance, uh, you know, showing you rent growth with a, a property manager that can, can do it. So all those uh, services we provide to the buyer in hopes of saying, hey, look, Let's look at our off-market deals that we've vetted and we love. And by the way, we focus on buyers. So we're not partial to the seller. Let's look at those together, find out what fits your criteria. 
and let's start getting some offers in on these properties for you. Wow, that's awesome. And I assume, uh, if I understand correctly, when as soon as you're doing a 1031, it has to go to some kind of custodian or something, right? Yeah, so 1031 exchange is to a 14 second overview. Yeah, give, give the high level, yeah, quick. Yeah, so on, on a 1031 exchange, when you're selling your property, once that closes, you got 45 days to identify up to three properties. And the funds though is very important on who handles the funds when your property closes. So that has to go to a qualified intermediary. And it really could be almost anybody that's at arm's length from you. However, we have a couple of individuals we recommend going with because they understand the rules, regulations, and are also very, very accessible, which is important because you're trying sometimes last minute to identify the best property out there. Your mind might change. So anyway, you, you got to have a third party hold the funds. Otherwise, the second you take that, let's say you, you take and you go, oh, whoops, I want to do a, a 1031 exchange on this. I just learned about it. Well, if you've already got that in your bank account, it's way too late and you're paying taxes on all that. So um, you got to have that. So you have 45 days to identify up to three properties. And from the date that your property closes that you sold, you have six months, uh, 180 days to close on one, two, or all three of those properties that you identified. And that can be in any market anywhere. It's not state specific. It can also be in any asset class. Maybe you've got farmland that you sold or, or you know, a forest reserve that you sold that was real estate, you can 1031 out of that property into any other kind of asset class in any state. It's a federal uh, federal IRS guideline. So, you know, if you need to learn more about 1031 exchange, of course, reach out. Even if you're not interested in the Kansas City market, happy to uh, to provide you some more insight into the, the finer details of that. And that, and and thank you for that. That was a great explanation. And, and 1031s are real estate only, correct? That's right. Yeah, investment it's, property to investment property. That's right. You can't, um, you used to be able to, but you can't sell a, an airplane and then uh, take that and reinvest in real estate and vice versa. Okay. Interesting. And it, and you can't sell your house, like your main residence either. It has to be an investment. Uh, that's right. Investment. Good point. Yep. Yep. It has to be deemed an investment. Now you can, uh, maybe you owned a house and you lived in it for two, three, four, five years. Uh, and then you decided to keep that house, but buy another one and you rented out your original house uh, as an investment property. You could do that and sell that in 1031. So even though you might have originally purchased it as your personal residence, uh, but if you still own it and you're renting it uh, right now, you could sell that in 1031 exchange out of that and, and defer your, your capital gains tax on it. Wow. Awesome. Love that. That's uh, they're very, very. Um... I know that some every once in a while they come on the chopping chopping block, but um, very very smart um, incentive tool really to use. And and oh by the way, you can pass them on. You know when you die, and mm -hmm. a lot of um, a lot of really great incentives in in the ten thirty one for sure. And uh, it seems like there's only a handful of people in the country who truly understand them. So it's important to have you know um qualified intermediaries like yourself to uh to handle that because like you said if you're if you get caught you do it incorrectly right the days go by you're stuck you got to pay the taxes yeah and there's so many people too that um commit to say you know i'll just pay the taxes i'll wait for the market to crash and pay the taxes and that scenario to me, you know, based on my recommendation of the, you know, hundreds of people I talk to every single month about 1031 is probably the worst thing you can do. And all the easiest way to explain why that is, is because you could buy a, a break even property or even something that, that loses a little bit of money, but the taxes, the, the tax benefit you gain from owning that new property is going to outweigh the fact that you're paying Uncle Sam 20%. And then you throw on top of that, the, this property that you're breaking even on, let's say it's a new construction property that just breaks even, you know, but there's no headaches on it because it's new construction. You can still 1031 exchange that property then again in a year 
to into something that you do like. So there's all sorts of different options. Anybody can own real estate for a year and handle the minimum headaches. But again, if you're buying something new construction, worst case, you know, and it breaks even or loses a dollar or two, it's better than paying 20% on your capital gains. There's something new I just learned. I didn't realize you only had to hold the next property for a year and then you could do it again. Yeah. Year and a day, they say, I mean, your, your qualified intermediate, your tax person is the expert on that. And actually, you know, it's been less than a year. It depends. Like if you come, if you bought a property, let's say today, and you fully intended to rent it out and you do rent it out, you collect rents on it for six or nine months. Somebody comes to you and offers you double what you paid for it. You know, there's a case there with the IRS that says, hey, look, you know, I wanted to, this is a rental property. This is an investment property, but you know, off market, somebody offered me double for this property. Um, you know, you can still 1031 exchange on that and uh, not be penalized. But, you know, that's all, that's more of a discussion for your, your qualified intermediary, your tax person. But I've seen it happen before with, uh, with past clients. Wow. That's incredible. That's good to know. Awesome. Yeah. We are not CPAs or tax advisors. So again, you know, just a disclaimer there. I want to make sure <laughs> we, we insert that in there. Uh, my attorney would be very happy to hear that I've inserted that uh, <laughs> right. <a> disclaimer. <laughs> so awesome. I love it. So one thing I've, I'm curious about is obviously we talked about Kansas City kind of being that that tried and true. Are rents getting kind of stagnant here in Salt Lake City? They've kind of flattened. Is that you guys as well? Or are you still seeing that that? Um, kind of three to 6% growth that you really always see over there? Yeah, we're still seeing uh, that that growth, especially in the suburbs. You know, with the pandemic, people did kind of say, okay, I don't want to live in this studio or one bedroom in the urban core. I'll just move out to the suburbs. I can work out there, do whatever. Uh, seeing a lot of good growth out in the suburbs. And then the class B, um, uh, class B and class C plus multifamily in the urban core. You know, again, it's affordable housing compared to I can't buy a, a, um, a house, I can't afford to or can't find one. So I'm just going to rent for a while. Right. And people want that good product. And that is definitely still increasing. Yeah, we're seeing three, four, five percent increases. Um, some of the rents that I've seen people get recently, I'm just like, wow, really? OK, that's great. Or stuff I was trying to you know, maybe had on the market a year ago, or not on the on our on our marketplace a year ago. Um, you know, and then I re pull a, a rent study for that, and yeah, it's you know fifty bucks more than last year on wow. what, what the market shows. So uh, we see some good rent growth now. Will that stop? You know, eventually everything does. Will that pause? Eventually everything does. But I think with with the focus, you know, we're on the B and C plus side of the of the industry and so in that area i think that'll continue to do well for a really long time because of the credit crunch and because of the the growing city that's awesome love that so pull out your uh, your muddy crystal ball here what do you kind of foresee for the future obviously as as we move forward here over the next you know 18 24 months yeah i mean the midwest is I think going to continue to um, grow. There's going to continue to be competition from out-of-state investors uh, in the next 18, 24 months. I also do think somewhere in there, we may see a rate drop, right? Like a Federal Reserve rate cut. Um, you know, it's all dependent on the, the economy at that point. And, you know, thankfully the the common lending tool that local lenders are using here, the five-year treasury, the 10-year treasury has fairly stable, you know, pretty much stabilized. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty stable here is what I'm saying. And I think that there also though is sellers that are coming to realize, you know, if I bought this property in 2021, 2022, you know, my original business plan was to hold this for five years. I might have to hold that for five years, you know, whereas if you bought in 2019, you're able to sell in 2022 uh, for a hefty profit. So there is some of that uh, going on. And I think, I mean, sellers are okay with that, but I don't think the bottom's just going to fall out 
of the market in Kansas City and people are going to, you know, need to fire sale their properties. Um, I don't know what market that would be for a fire fire sale right now, maybe some of the class A stuff and some of the hotter markets, but um, usually on a refinance, you can, in a multifamily refinance, you can get right with your numbers. So I don't know if any market's going to have a, a fire sale. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. I've been, I've been kind of preaching that same kind of outlook as well, where, you know, obviously like, you know, I mentioned Austin be, uh, earlier, right? Obviously if you go up that high, you're going to have to come down. Right. So you're seeing, I think like a 10% kind of decrease, but you know, relative to the 22, 23%, you know, rent rental increases they had, that's really not, not terrible. So um, yeah, I definitely agree, but I really think it's more at this point, more the operator specific and not necessarily the asset itself. And it's really going to be based on, on the debt, which obviously we're seeing, we saw what happened in Houston and, and um, just kind of these sort of one-off scenarios where, you know, they just got in, in hot water, whether they need to recapitalize another property or it was that one itself that had bad debt, but it, yeah, you know, with, with um, real estate and people that aren't, don't live it every single day, like probably you and I, maybe more of the, either the passive investor or somebody who buys a property every couple of years or whatever, you know, there are a lot of people that feel like I, I can get a steal of a deal here pretty soon when the market drops. And there might be one or two or half a percent or something like that, where there is a fire sale on, you know, I'm making this up 10 people in Kansas city. And, but do you think as an investor, you're going to be one of those lucky 10 people that get that investment? Maybe you are, but real estate really isn't this get rich quick uh, kind of situation. It's a market derived on building wealth. And so if you're getting into real estate to get rich quick, I probably don't want to work with you. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to, you know, get into real estate to build wealth for you and your family and your legacy, love to love to keep doing that. Absolutely. I love that. 100%. It's a get rich slow scheme, as we like to say, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, you will as long as you do it correctly. And you have that long term outlook. Now, certainly, you know, if you can write for a little bit, and I'm not sure, did this happen in Kansas City? Did you have some of those deals at sort of two, two and a half, three X in like 18 months, like some of these top markets did? Yeah, I don't know if it was that big of a jump, but it was definitely like a holy crap, that property is selling for that. I remember, you know, seeing that on the market two years ago for, you know, 30% less or 40, you know, whatever it was. So there definitely was some, you know, big jumps, but it wasn't the the two X, but it was, you know, hefty profits. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty crazy there for a sec. Investors got spoiled and everybody's coming back down to earth. And it's like, okay, this is what, this is what it really is like. Right. And and obviously there's some other things that, you know, I, I think uh, interest rates will start to come down next year and, and some things will smooth out. And then I think we'll, we'll be right in back in that sort of equilibrium again, hopefully. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. really knows our muddy, our, our crystal balls are very muddy. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been awesome, Alex. I really appreciate all of your insights. It's been absolutely incredible. Uh, we'll go ahead and wind down here and we'll jump to the final five. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Well, besides the one where the guy uh, told me, hey, look, you got to do, <laughs> you got to get your real estate license, which was a heck of advice. Um, but, you know, we've talked a little bit about Logan Freeman. He's also a mentor of mine. And uh, just staying calm, you know, there's always highs and lows, even throughout your day and your week, and is to level set that you know, this is normal, this is life, you know, when you're self-employed, at least definitely for me, it was an adjustment on just, you know, kind of the highs and lows. Um, so just level setting and, and your life is always a, a marathon, not a sprint. I love that so much. Yeah, very, very wise words. Logan is uh, filled with a lot of that. And um, great guy. Also a very large human as well. Very intimidating human, but the sweet, but the nicest person. That's the best part about him. I love it. Yes. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Um, I think 
again, being able to help people build wealth. You know, I'm not the type of, of agent or person that is classified probably as a people pleaser, but it's, you know, more of an advisor and just really, and I enjoy doing that, right? Like I might not tell you what you want to know, what you want to hear, but I'm going to tell you what I think you should do um, in, in these given situations. And so I feel fulfilled by that. Just, you know, seeing the, the wealth that we've helped people build over the last several years is, is pretty awesome. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Non-real estate. Um, uh, let's see here. There is, that's a great question. Um, I've read so, oh, um, there's one that I was actually just talking to, to Logan about, and it's called The Innovator's DNA. Um, it has nothing to do with real estate, but it's a book about how these top innovators in the world think. And there's five components to it. And it's, um, it's all about, you know, experiencing, networking, testing, and, and how like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and, you know, Steve Jobs went about accelerating their, their growth and taking all these risks. But it's a pretty good uh, book on just thinking. And it's nothing about real estate, but it's just thinking. I love that. That's awesome. I added that to the list. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, probably ooh, superpower, probably the ability to fly. <laughs> Definitely. That's mine yeah. too, for sure. I got to get out of the, you know, just get me over there quickly and, you know, not to deal with traffic. <laughs> you seriously, right? You imagine flying over the traffic like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Be quick. Nice and easy. I love it. Awesome. Uh, last one. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? So you can email me, Alex, at Exchange Commercial Real Estate. It's with uh, with an X you can see behind me here. Um, LinkedIn. I'm all over LinkedIn constantly uh, trying to provide value to people that follow me. So A. Olson uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, and then check out our website, exchangecre.com. And love to hear from you and talk real estate or wealth, <clears throat> excuse me, wealth building or whatever, whatever you're interested in right now. Awesome. We will link that in the show notes, make it super easy. Alex, thank you again so much for your time. This was awesome. Appreciate being here, man. This was fun. Absolutely. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.